Betty's story has to be an inspiration to people at a young age, happening to them, having an injury that was so large. Your whole life all of a sudden is in an uproar. It, it has to be mind-boggling. We were like honeymooners. You don't expect your wife to almost die after two years of marriage. Right now I'm teaching grade six. You're busy getting them ready for high school in the real world. Okay, she believed in herself, and by believing in herself, she was able to do it, and she was overcoming all sorts of odds. This is like every little girl's dream. You want to grow up, you want to have a family, you want to have children, you want to have your house in the suburbs. Mitchell and I got married uh, June 22nd, 1975. We just had a great time being a young married couple, looking forward to starting off having our whole future ahead of us. It was a big wedding. I remember it was a very big wedding, like 250 people. They just blossomed with something really nice. She finished teaching college, and she went right into teaching, living a life that young married couples live. It happened a Victoria Day weekend. I was about four and a half months pregnant with my first child. She was young, she was married, she was pregnant. Everything ahead of them. And all of a sudden, you take a boat ride on a Sunday afternoon, and everything stops. In Montreal's southwest region is the body of water known as Lac St. Louis. That particular day was Mitchell's birthday, and we were going out on my father's boat. It was the first day of the season. It was Victoria Day. It was a routine Sunday afternoon, beautiful afternoon. I was lying on the boat and taking the sun and reading a book, relaxing. I was pregnant, so I figured it would be a nice, relaxing day. The baby wasn't due until the end of November, so I figured I was going to enjoy my summer. They were unaware that the tide level had dropped. They went back out on the water, and that's when disaster struck. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, I hear my father yell, oh my god. And it turned out there were three rocks jutting out in the water. And the boat came along and hit the rocks full force. And I was flung out of the boat. And I landed on rocks in the water. On the first impact, she landed on rocks and that tore up her back. Frantically, Jack tried to bring the boat around to rescue his daughter, but there was no time. The boat started to like slide forward and run over my midsection. And as it was coming up over my midsection, I saw the propeller coming up towards me this way. And I just turned my body a little bit that the propeller came and sliced me open. And the motor, the blade cut her from her neck till her waist. But I couldn't see Betty. And in the middle of the lake and your wife disappears. That's when I looked around and saw her like about 10, 15 feet away. She was standing in knee deep water and her, her intestines, her body organs were hanging out. I saw all this stuff, for lack of a better word, hanging out of me. I had no idea if that was the baby. I was four and a half months pregnant. I didn't know if that was my baby. I didn't know if that was my guts, if it was my organs. I had no idea what it was. Mitchell immediately jumped into the icy cold water, holding his wife in his arms. And he just came up behind me and took everything that he saw hanging out and shoved it into the cavity, put his hand over it. What already got in, whatever dirt was in the water was already inside her. So I wanted to keep it closed enough until we got to the ambulance. All I wanted to do was go to sleep and just close my eyes. Mitchell kept saying, stay awake, stay awake, you're not allowed to go to sleep, you have to stay awake. I remember I was sitting in my living room in my apartment, and the phone rang, and it was my dad. Where are you? What's, you know, what's going on? Betty, something happened to Betty. I said, what happened to Betty? I don't know how to tell you this, I don't know what I did, how uh, is going on, I may have killed her. He just, at that point, was just repeating himself. He felt that it was his fault what happened. They didn't know what kind of condition I was in. They didn't know what kind of condition my baby would be in. And the doctor was talking to Mitchell that if they had to make a choice about saving one of us, which one it should be. And um, just before they went to operate, I told the doctor, if I have a choice between saving my wife or the baby, save my wife, I'll get another baby later. And I was busy saying, no, you've got to protect the baby. I understand where Mitchell was coming from, but me as a mother, I knew where I was coming from. I just wanted to save this baby. All Betty ever wanted was to, you know, be married and have children and build a home. 
and this was her first child, and she just kept moaning, my baby, my baby. And it just tore me apart. The night for me was just mostly waiting and looking at the clock while they're operating. She's in surgery already six, seven hours. Nobody's telling us anything. We don't know what's going on. I mean, her life was, was on a limb. Her life was, was hanging by the line. I know the surgery lasted many hours. Um, they had to like rebuild me and figure out how to rebuild me, but they kept hearing the heartbeat, so they knew the baby was alive. But what was gonna happen with all the x-rays and the Demerol I was on and blood transfusions I had, we had no idea what was gonna happen um, to the baby. All the odds for my baby were really stacking up against her. I was told it was something like 350 to 450 stitches to sew me back together again. I was told that they weren't sure if I would walk again because they didn't know how everything would heal. What Betty felt most during her experience in the hospital was her father's desperate sadness. My father was just walking around. I remember holding his hands on his head and going, oh my God, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? He was sure that in one day he'd managed to kill his daughter and grandchild and the guilt nearly destroyed the gentle, kind men. When you see your father walking around to the extent like I killed my daughter, I killed my grandchild, I got well for him more than getting well for me. She's always said that because of my dad, she said she was going to walk again. She just kept doing it and, and pushing herself to do it. The day that I was able to start walking, I had the nurse wheel me in the wheelchair down to the elevator and the elevator's doors opened up and I saw my father walk out and I stood up in the wheelchair and I walked to him. And just seeing the look on his face when I walked him because he hadn't seen me walk yet since the accident happened, like that just blew, it blew me away. That like just made up for everything. And the first time she walked, there was such a transformation in him that was worth it. She improved continuously without many setbacks until the day she was able to remove her bandages. After seeing the scars and the stitches and everything, we pull over to the end of the driveway and I lost it. Everything that was in me, I was crying, I was yelling, I was screaming, I was swear I, I was a mess. I had no idea if I was going to be giving birth to a normal child, a disfigured child. I had absolutely no clue. She had so many tests and procedures during her hospital stay, taking Demerol and had x-rays and five blood transfusions, all things normally not recommended during a pregnancy. I honestly in my heart felt that this was going to be the only child I was ever going to have, and because of that it was very important for her to survive. Everyone's apprehensive, everyone's nervous, everyone's not knowing what's going to happen. And the baby Betty carried during her terrible accident? That was me. The joy that I felt and the gratitude that she was born perfect and healthy and normal. Everybody was fawning over this miracle child, you know, including me. I mean, not only the first child, but a miracle. When my father saw that Jennifer was born and she was okay, he regained like 20 years of his life back again. For the first time in a long time, I saw him, a deep, genuine smile, a deep, <sighs> he, we gained a little bit of himself when I started to walk, but I think Jennifer's birth is what brought him almost back to his old self. You could not come between Jennifer and my father. This was like his little angel. He and I became like best friends. At first, I never thought I'd be doing anything again. I, uh, I, was thrilled I was home, I had a baby, she survived, everything worked out well. I was back at school, I was able to have a normal life. It was a major accomplishment. It was stuff I never thought I'd ever experience again. I'm here and I'm alive and I'm back to doing what I always wanted to do. She's had to deal with a lot, but she is the most upbeat, most laid back, most loving person I know. The accident made her a stronger person. She's tougher for it. Betty and Mitchell now have four children, ranging in ages from 25 to 15. With two daughters, two sons, a cat and a dog, they couldn't have anything closer to a normal life. I think it just made me say, I appreciate life and enjoy it to the fullest.
Thank <laughs> you.